Welcome to Out of the Question, a podcast that looks behind some common questions and uncovers the question behind the question while providing real solutions for biblical world and life view. Your co-hosts are Andrea Schwartz, a teacher and mentor, and Pastor Charles Roberts. Thanks again for joining us for this edition of the Out of the Question podcast. Uh, My co-host, Charles Roberts, and I are going to do something a little bit different. We are going to talk about books that have had an impact on us and books that we think are worthy of recommendation. For me, a book that's worthy of recommendation is a book that spurs on discussion, a book that gives you a greater understanding of that which you should be doing in regards to a biblical world and life view. But some books are actually useful for understanding what you should not do or a wrong application of something. So, Charles, let's kind of get into, first of all, the idea of why people should even bother to have a library that's an actual intentional library. Well, I think the answer to that question is that it's crucially important if we are going to understand who we are and what's going on in the world today, or even in the world in which our parents lived who gave us birth, uh, we have to have some context and some history to put that in. And so having books that speak to these things on a variety of levels is crucially important. And I'm not trying to sound like a Luddite, but I think it's important to have actual paperback or preferably hardbound books to reference and read. Uh, I, I do have a Kindle and I do have books in that format, perhaps many of them. But as some people may be aware, you do not actually own those books. They can be removed from your Kindle library or whatever the equivalent might be with some of the other platforms. That doesn't often happen, but in light of the way things have been going, it might well. But there's also the fact that the, the book that we hold in the highest regard and the book that I think we both would agree should be in everyone's library, Holy Scripture, is itself a library, a compilation of 66 books. And even if you have a preferred version or one that you think is the only version that's worth referencing, um, I think it's useful, and I know Dr. Rush Dooney did, had a number of different translations at his disposal for nothing else other than maybe greater clarity or understanding or a nuance that might not necessarily, for example, come through on the King James Version since the English language has indeed changed over time. Yes, I think that's vitally important. You can find in some of his writings where he quotes the uh, Berkeley Version So yes, it's very helpful to have different translations to refer to. The kind of books that we're going to be talking about today, I think, are books that you said could potentially have a very strong impact on a person's life, and that will be a a personal issue. However, there are books that are almost universally agreed upon as centrally important books, and there's so many we can't possibly cover them in one sitting or recommend all of them, but we necessarily will be speaking from our own experience. Exactly. Now, I want to kind of get something out right at the beginning. There are a lot of people who will say, okay, well, Charles is a pastor, so he has time to read. He's employed by his church so that he will study. And in my case, I, you know, they'll say, well, you no longer have children in your home. But I really want to dispel the myth that people don't have time to read. First of all, if you truly don't have time to read, then you need to carve out a part of your schedule and that in. Um, There are a lot of people who say they don't have time to sleep or they don't have time to eat. Well, that may be true, but if you don't sleep and if you don't eat, eventually you're going to have other problems. So I would say that it's vitally important for the believer to constantly be understanding the Bible, which is the primary book that the believer should be reading, but then have helps in terms of the application of the Bible to every area of life and thought. So Dr. Rosh Dooney used to talk about the Bible being like eyeglasses. Um, If you happen to be uh, farsighted, 
you need glasses to read. It's very hard to read if you don't have corrective lenses. And he used to use the analogy that the Bible was the corrective lens. So I'm going to start from the premise that you should know your Bible. And then the books that we're going to talk about that were our favorites or noteworthy books are books that are going to include things that helped us understand the Bible better. And to go ahead and say, well, like the second example that you don't have children anymore in your home. Well, I did a lot of the reading of the books that I'm even going to recommend while I did, but I made use of the time if I was waiting at a piano lesson or I was waiting at some sort of sporting event, um, I had what I called my auto university. So I had books that specifically stayed in my car so that when I had five minutes there, 10 minutes here, whatever it was, I could read them. And I think in what we're experiencing today as a society is that we have to know history. We have to know how these things weave together if we're going to be the salt and light the Bible calls us to be. Yes. And speaking of having books in your car and the issue of not having enough time to read, certainly the other platforms that provide books to us, such as audiobooks, books on MP3 format, you know, th these are plenty, there are plenty of opportunities for people to uh, ingest the content of books, either by sight or by hearing. Some people, I guess, are more wired one way or the other. Uh, but if you really don't have time to sit down and hold a book in front of your face and read it, uh, you're going to be in your car more often than not. And so there are plenty of options for uh, almost, uh, almost all books are available in audio now, including uh, the vast library of Dr. Rushduni's works. And then one last thing, and because of the last year, there haven't been as many conferences, but when I would go to a conference, the best part of any conference for me was the book table. And I would go through and I would buy a lot of books. People would joke, do you like jewelry? No, I like books. And the idea is, well, I don't have time to read all these books. Well, if you see a book at a book table or you see one advertised, the way I did things is if I thought this was something interesting and I wanted it, I had money set aside in order to buy books. And you know what? I might not read all those books that I bought for years, but I thought they were worth having in the library, my library, so that when situations came up or I had questions, I could go to that book and count on the fact that there would be an orientation that would help me understand things. So, I'm with you. It's good to have the hard copy. But what I would suggest to people who have Kindle books or even books from Audible or any recording, if you like the book, then invest in the hard copy because a book worth reading or listening to once is worth listening or reading many times. Yes, I totally agree with that. I'll start with you. Talk about books in terms of a category or subject matter who the author was, and why they had a particular impact. Well, let me just say, first of all, that yes, I am a pastor, and so I am, quote unquote, a professional who studies and reads a lot, although I think I was actually reading more uh, before I went into the ministry <laughs> than I do now. Uh, but I am not, as I understand what we're doing here, I'm not going to be speaking specifically of commentaries and things such as that. I think that's something right. for a, a different discussion. But I'm going to be speaking, first of all, about a, number, a couple of books that I read very early in my life that had, for very different reasons, profound impacts on me. And one was a book called None Dare Call It Treason by John Stormer. I was born in the early 50s. And so by the time I was 10 or 11 years old, the ferment in American society was uh, fairly significant, especially here in the South where I grew up. And people were aware that some of the things that were going on were not what they appeared to be and that there were conspiracies, especially involving uh, active communists who were behind a number of the movements uh, that were fomenting the unrest and the attempts to completely change our society. If that sounds like uh, I'm talking about what's happening today, that's no coincidence, but the roots of it go back many, many years to the time I'm talking about. And this book it must have sold millions of copies because there were people who were concerned about what was happening. And in None Dare Call It Treason, uh, Stormer goes into the details about some of the better known figures in the um, political left, uh, the civil rights movement, and some of the general things that were happening. And he 
cites references chapter and verse where many of these things that were happening were not by accident and that there were people with agendas behind the various things that were happening who, who had not the best interest of a uh, Christian worldview or what was left even of a nominal Christian America back in those days. And that was a real eye-opener for me, even as a young man. I think it was about, I don't know, 12 or 13 when I read that book. So that that is one. And the other that came a few years later from a totally different perspective, and by that time, I myself had changed my perspective on things. This was Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. I read that book, I think, when I was a sophomore in high school. It, it was a fascinating book as a, as a young man to read because it sort of portrays this futuristic society. And what's so amazing about it, that along, of course, with the Orwell's 1984, looks as if it's all coming true today on some measure. But Huxley looked forward to a world that was largely automated and based on eugenics and where you had people who were genetically engineered to, say, function purely as menial labor laborers. And then you had another class of people who devoted most of their time to physical pleasure. The, the fact that that book was written when it was 50 or more years ago, and the fact that it portrays things, it was sort of prescient, maybe even predictive programming, if I can put it that way, uh, about what's happening today. So those two books in particular, early on in my life, were very important. And I recommend them to all of our listeners. So would you say that looking back on the impression that both those books had on you, that although you understand them and look at them differently now, you think they were foundational in helping you receive the word of God as what God wanted for mankind? I do specifically because in the first one that I mentioned, he points out how evil men come together to conspire, uh, to plot uh, against the, the goodness of an order that's based even loosely on biblical principles. And that certainly itself is a biblical principle. We see this in the book of Psalms, for example, mm -hmm. and the first two Psalms where the Lord talks about this very thing of the, the people uh, plotting against the Lord and his anointed. But then in Brave New World, that gave me a context much later to look back and say, this is the vision of a society completely divorced from God's law and the foundational worldview of Holy Scripture. And it's nightmarish. Uh, I, don't, I don't think Huxley wrote that book with the idea that, oh, this is what we should all work for. Uh, I think it was perhaps in some way a warning. So yes, I do believe these were foundational in that sense. So interestingly enough, I went to private schools up through high school. I spent a couple of years in college. And in looking back on books that had a very significant impact on me, I couldn't think of one. Of course, my interlude of deciding that I was going to pursue truth had me in a cult for 10 years. And in that particular cult, you didn't read a lot. You just sort of followed orders and did what you were supposed to do. So when I came to faith, it's not fair to say I was a blank slate because I was not, but I found myself reading the Bible the way somebody might drink a bottle of water if you've been thirsty for a very long time. And so I would read the Bible, understanding parts of it, the Clearly, the New Testament was easier to understand than the Old Testament, but there was this idea of that we should be righteous, be righteous, be holy. And for the life of me, I couldn't figure out how, how to do it. If I was doing it, how would I know? Um, having been raised Catholic, I remember all the pictures of the halos. And when I looked in the mirror, I didn't see a halo. So I, I didn't know <laughs> if I was doing it correctly. <laughs> and then I ran into Rush Dooney's the Institutes of Biblical Law. And somebody might say, well, that's a huge book. That's the first. And it's like, I was so hungry. And when I discovered that righteousness was synonymous with justice, then that became the foundational premise by which I could then understand the scripture. And, you know, it's been a number of decades now. So I would not say that I have reached that, but his book, the Institutes of Biblical Law, and then his book on modern psychology or psychology, Revolt Against Maturity, were like these giant keys that opened these locked doors for me 
And suddenly, not only could I understand things, but I had such a huge appetite for gaining knowledge. It was like I had been dehydrated, didn't know that I needed water and wasn't all that thirsty. It didn't feel like I needed water, but that once I started getting the water, I started having a greater demand to drink. And so both of those books had a profound influence. And I don't think it'll be any surprise to people who know me because I've hung around Calcedon since then that these were life-changing moments for me. So would you say then that the Institutes of Biblical Law sort of functioned for you as a, as a framework in order to better understand the scriptures? Absolutely, because having gone to Catholic school and been in Catholic churches, I'll be honest, you don't read the Bible. You just listen and you kind of get tidbits here and there. So it wasn't this idea of this was a systematic way to live life. And so not only did it provide the architecture for it, but it gave me a sense that I could spend a lifetime absorbing this and I would never run out of the opportunity to learn more. I totally agree. I think that's one of the uh, the great advantages of his writings. And I, I have a t- couple of those titles in, in my list. But the fact is, uh, if you're going to read the Bible, in which, of course, we encourage everyone to do so, you have to read it from some framework. There has to be some architecture around it. And there are many competing frameworks for your attention in reading the Bible. So uh, the point is, do those architectures start from within Scripture itself and build outward? Or is it something that's constructed outside of Scripture and then given to you and say, no, this is, this is what you need to sort of place over the Bible as you read it? And I think one of the great advantages of Rush Dooney's work uh, he's certainly not alone in this, but for, for us, I think one of the main ones is that he starts with the worldview given to us from within Scripture uh, and moves out, outward. And like any good experience with reading, once you have been impacted by an author, it makes good sense to pursue that author in, a, in as many aspects as you can. Now, not every author writes voluminously like Rush Dooney did. But understanding that the the stem from which he's going to explain history or economics or other things like that, I benefited from all his books that way. I wouldn't say that they had the same impact as those two that I mentioned. And it probably had to do, they produced such a shift in my perspective. And that's one of the values of uh, great books, whether they're books that are universally agreed upon to a large extent as being great books or whether it's a title that you've come across that has that sort of paradigm shifting power uh, behind it. If I may, I'll go ahead and mention another few titles that were influential in my life, again, in sort of my nominally Christian days. I'll add that in the home I grew up in, which was a, a Methodist home that was broadly evangelical, as most Christian homes were in that time in the United States, with some exceptions, but I knew the Bible. I went to church every Sunday, but it really didn't seem to have any application to my life. You know, I was getting that from public schooling and things like that about how you live. So when I come back full circle to some of these other books, it's because I began to realize that the Bible does have have an explanation for these things. But I mentioned uh, Brave New World. Another book that I read around the same time was The Stranger by Albert Camus, the French-Algerian existential philosopher and novelist. Now, the reason that book was so important to me, because as, um, as a young man in high school and going into college, I was searching for answers and things like that, and somebody had recommended it to me. And that, this is one of these books that really had a powerful impact. I've never forgotten just putting down the, the last page. It's like my whole worldview had shifted, but not in a positive way in retrospect, of course, because the the basic thrust of that book is about a man who, uh, whose mother has died. And that's one of the riveting things about the book is that it starts out with that first sentence, today, mother died. And it goes on from there to talk about how really unaffected he is by that event. And then it morphs later into him being involved in a murder. The basic thrust is that life is largely meaningless. There's nothing, no architecture, to continue to use that term, that makes life mean much of anything except the experience of the moment. And again, that gave me a reference later to say, nobody can live their life this way. 
And it's interesting that that same author, Camus, once wrote that the only meaningful philosophical question is whether or not we ought to commit suicide. Wow. So it sounds to me like part of what shaped you was this pursuit of understanding philosophies. And you had a grounding in the Bible, but I know from your past, you sort of drifted away and experimented with different ways of viewing the world. But I find it interesting that the books that you mentioned would not be anyway categorized as decidedly Christian, yet they've had a positive effect on your understanding of God's Word. Yes, and that's why I think we have to be very cautious with anybody who considers himself a fundamentalist. Well, pardon me, but with a fundamentalist attitude that, you know, we, we touch not the unclean thing. You don't read this. You don't do that. You da 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 No, the fact is, if we're going to understand the world, uh, we have to know what the world is saying. And once we do have a, a powerfully biblical worldview and understanding, then we can interact with these things without being corrupted by them and recognize them for what they are. Now, not everybody's going to start out that way reading these books. Some people will start out with, say, where I did and many millions of other people looking to these kind of things for guidance. And sooner or later, if people are sincere in that pursuit, they will recognize that you don't get guidance from these things. You only run into a dead end, a brick wall, and ultimately it leads to a meaningless life, a very difficult life to live. But think about it. If you encounter someone who has been influenced by Camus or Huxley, you have an understanding that you can relate in a way that someone who has not could only say, well, I think those guys are wrong. And they'd say, really, what part? And then the person says, well, I've never really read them. So it's useful to be able to synthesize your understanding of scripture and then be able to speak to a culture or people who have looked to this for guidance. Indeed, yes. And that, has, uh, that opportunity has presented itself to me on a number of occasions uh, over the years. I used to remember in reading Rush's books, how he would quote some people that he would say he didn't agree with. And I, I said, you, you read some of the most awful books. And he said, yes, I do. <laughs> he said, and I wouldn't recommend them. But he's going, he went at them because he wanted to be able to explain a phenomenon. And I, for one, am glad that I could glean from his experience without having to experience it myself. And I can tell you a place where that actually, um, I encountered that sort of thing, and there was uh, what they were. There would later be an intersection between my reading of Rush Dooney and something that I had been exposed to in my pre-Christian days when I was a philosophy major in college and a religious studies major. One of the books that we were assigned reading in one particular class was the 120 Days of Sodom by the Marquis de Sade, and. Wow. Dr. Rostini actually references that book, I think, in his book on pornography. But the interesting thing about that is it's not something I recommend for the lighthearted or the fainthearted, but you can see that the, the sort of bizarre corruption of sexuality and what it means to be a human that we see today, that was prefigured centuries ago. In the, and, it, and it's that way for anyone who sets out with the premise that there is no God, there cannot be a God. And so we have to build anew with our, our great human project. And that always tends toward violence, uh, puerile sexuality, and tyranny. Right. So to go back to the idea of books that should be in a library, you know, when I first started reading, I never paid any attention to the index of a book. I barely <laughs> read the footnotes. But the more you go along and you want to understand more either about an author and where that author obtained the perspective, the more you realize how valuable those are. And so some people say, well, let's say I encounter a book. How do I know if it's a good book? How do I know if it's a reliable book on history or any number of other subjects? Well, if you have a framework, the index can be a very useful tool by going to the index and finding a subject that you have a definite perspective on that you know that your perspective is based on scripture and then go and read the selection that's referenced. And very quickly, you'll get an idea whether this will be a book that helps you with the shoulds of your life or 
that it still might be useful in terms of the should nots. So let's say you're reading a book by an evolutionist. Does that mean you shouldn't? Because if you're reading a book about evolution, then you're sitting against God. No, but you're going to encounter people who have been taught evolution, who have an evolutionary worldview. And the better you are at, just like I mentioned to you, Charles, that you had read Camus, you had read Huxley, that puts you in a position to really show the light of scripture as opposed to the darkness of other philosophies. Yeah, I had to laugh when you mentioned that about the uh, tables of contents and the indices. Nowadays, that's where I start when I, when I find a new book. That's the first place I look is the, in, the index. Because I, I, like you just said, I want to see who are they quoting, who are they referencing, how, if he's you know, referencing one particular theologian or philosopher or modern writer, how many pages in the index are devoted to that writer. So that's a real roadmap to, uh, to what you're about to read or, or may read. But I want to ask you, could you name another title or two that were influential in your life? Yes. Now, the next two are related, but again, spoke to something that at the time I needed. So one was a very short book entitled The Voice of Authority. The author is Marston. And it was this idea that there are no contradictions in scripture, that if you take things like the Trinity or you take things like the, the dual nature of Jesus Christ, um, fully God, fully man, but the two natures don't intertwine. So he wasn't a human being who had godlike powers and therefore didn't really experience the things we did. So the, this book is about apparent paradoxes in scripture, but he really makes the point that authority has to do with the author. And at the time, that was a really new concept for me. I was like, oh, yeah, wait, that, that word is in the word authority. And so it was grasping the idea that if I was going to understand this, I would have to believe it before I understood it. And then, of course, later on, I heard the famous quote, we don't understand in order to believe, we believe in order to understand because if we want wisdom, if we want understanding, the first thing we have to do is fear the Lord, fear God, because he's the author. So that was a huge aha moment for me. And you said there was another title besides the voice yes, of authority? Arthur Pink's The Sovereignty of God. Oh, yes. That's an, uh, the uh, unedited version. Yeah. <laughs> Please. So, so why is that important? Well, sovereignty was a word I didn't understand. I mean, I heard it. But there are a lot of words that you hear that you don't really understand the meaning of. So Arthur Pink's book was like, what does it mean that God is sovereign? Well, hanging out with what he had to say made me realize that the sovereignty of God is tied into my being able to be anxious for nothing, to take Christ's burden on me, and then he'll take my burdens on him because Everything that happens is foreordained. Now, I may not understand the rationale, and certainly <laughs> I wouldn't do it that way, but I always tell people that's probably a good thing because if I was making these kinds of decisions, since I'm not omnipotent, since I'm not omniscient, my decrees, my decisions would not be in keeping with all things working together for the good. So, just realizing that and that book and the, what I gained from that book has helped me in so many instances because, for example, when I used to travel by plane, I hated takeoffs. I had mm. read too much that said, when, if you're going to crash, that's usually when you crash. <laughs> and I would sit there going, well, what are all the things I haven't accomplished yet or all the things I didn't do? And then I would just kind of circle back to use a more common expression these days to, okay, if this is your last day on earth and you're going to crash with this plane, then it was foreordained and you don't have to have anxiety over this, but you can trust God with your, you trusted him with your past and your present. So trust him with your future. And usually by the time I'd go through that whole thinking process, Charles, I fall asleep and then I go, oh, we took off. 
So that book had uh, a, a double blessing associated with it. Absolutely. That you, you yeah. don't stress over what's happening in any situation because God is sovereign. And if you lose the sense that he's in control, then you're going to look to another God. Well, I think that's an example of how the books that we read, uh, that especially, well, it's exclusively, I may say, those that are based on biblical wisdom uh, have a lasting impact in a positive way throughout our lifetime. So your turn. Well, as I'm, I'm, I'm giving these titles sort of as I have transitioned in my life toward from a, a non-biblical worldview to a Christian biblical worldview. And when I began to make that transition, I, I remembered something that a, a great British philosopher once said that who was not a Christian. He said, I, I can have a great deal of respect for those fundamentalist type Christians who say that the Bible is true and therefore you ought to believe it. But he said, I have nothing but utter disdain for people who claim to be Christians and say, you ought to believe what the Bible teaches because it makes you a nicer person. <laughs> and what I have found as I you know, transitioned by God's grace into a Christian worldview and believing what scripture teaches, I found that that was largely what had happened, that there were people in traditional churches, whether it's Roman Catholic or Protestant, I'm not sure, I don't know enough about the Orthodox to say, but that um, the, there was, had been a large scale abandonment of the Bible as absolute truth, and that Scripture teaches truth statements that are to be believed and that these have an impact. And what I found was that a lot of that was a direct result of uh, so-called Christian leaders and theologians having read some of the corrupting books, if I can use the word, that I had read as a younger man and, and taking them to heart. So that, for example, Christianity was no longer being grounded in uh, biblical religion, but in a modern, say, existentialist type of expression. And so I was despairing for a while. And one of the reasons I rejected Christianity, because I didn't think there was any Christians who could answer, say, someone like a, a Albert Camus or a Jean-Paul Sartre or a Bertrand Russell. But then I discovered the writings of Francis Schaeffer and also J. Gresham Machen. Machen helped me see in his great book, Christianity and Liberalism, which I highly recommend to everyone, that what passes as progressive, we would say today, or liberal Christianity is in fact not Christianity at all. It's an entirely different religion, starting from an entirely different standpoint. And that little book, it's only about 150 pages, is written so profoundly simple, but yet scholarly, that it's just an enjoy to read, but it's also very enlightening. But that's dealing specifically with theological topics as it relates to Christianity. Uh, as a theological subject. But then I found Francis Schaeffer's writings, and especially his book, The God Who Was There, and then the other two that followed. Uh, because here was someone who actually knew about Camus and Hegel and Sartre and Bertrand Russell and all these men who had written and spoken in the early and mid 20th century that had a profound impact on, on the way the world was going. And he interacted with them in a way that showed that he not only understood them, but he could show how scripture refutes what they say, and that their whole starting point was completely mistaken. Now, I would later find that Schaefer himself was standing on the shoulders of others who had gone before him, one of whom was Cornelius Van Til, and the other, not quite so well-known, was R.J. Rushdoony. And in discovering Dr. Rushdoony's writings, that sort of put me all the way into the path of, a, of really having a full orb view of what Scripture teaches. I was thinking about this in preparing for our discussion, and I remembered uh, something that the British philosopher Alfred North Whitehead said, that modern European philosophy is all just a footnote to Plato. And if I can borrow that, and I'm, I'm biased, I don't mind admitting it, I think any serious biblical reflection on our current culture is a footnote to Rush Dooney, whether they would acknowledge it or not. Mm -hmm. So I found Rush Dooney's uh, little book, Law and Liberty, especially helpful. I read that book when I was in seminary. I guess like a lot of people, I had a copy of the Institutes of Biblical Law. I didn't crack it open that often because I had so much other reading to do. But I found for my reading schedule at the time, Law and Liberty, which is sort of a, a, a distillation in some way, uh, a much easier read for me at the time, and he, he addressed so many of the topics that were important and that I, I had been struggling with uh, and, and showed that you, you don't get away from a moral foundation. The question is, what is the foundation and where is it coming from? So uh, those books in particular, uh, Francis Schaeffer's The God Who Was There and the other two in the trilogy, 
uh, Machen's Christianity and Liberalism and Dr. Rushdoony's Law and Liberty. I'll, uh, I'll mention those for now. All right. So think about it. In God's economy, there are going to be lots of different servants that he has that will speak to individual people. And a lot of people don't know that Francis Schaeffer and Dr. Rush Juni were in communication with each other. So it's not so much a question of who was better. They were both useful and God's servants in terms of helping people further the kingdom of God. And so I don't think that there needs to be this view of which one was better. If it sounds like different people had different impacts on both of us, and I'm sure our listeners will agree that sometimes you're primed for something and that's why it has such an impact. Yes. And I think it's a testimony to Dr. Rastuni's understanding of what you just said and the character of the man that that writer in particular borrowed wholesale from some of his writings and put them into a book with his own name. And Dr. Rastuni was very much aware of that, but he took that same attitude. Well, you know, I, even though I'm not given attribution as the source of this material, I know it's reaching people. And, and you know, that's the sort of thing I, I'll, I'll also say about Francis Schaeffer is that at the time when his pop, his books were much more popular than they are nowadays, and, and I think that's lamentable in, to some extent, uh, someone, say, who's a sophomore in college was much more likely to encounter and read Francis Schaeffer than they were R.J. Rustuni or Cornelius Van Til or Gordon Clark. But yet Schaeffer was able to take those writings and put them in a popular format that brought the same message across and, and had a far greater impact. So I'm, I'm very grateful that uh, Dr. Rushdooney recognized that and, you know, was fine with people. You know, we're, we're all in this battle together. Let's get the message out. Exactly. So I'll go back now and, and give you two more books that, well, actually three, because I have two by one author. Now, I told you that I was very interested in Revolt Against Maturity as one of the titles that impacted me. And part of it is that I always had a bent in terms of understanding how people think, why people do the things they do. And my first experience in college with psychology, and I may have related this story be previously, is that I'm sitting in this psychology class and the professor is spouting off different views of things. And, you know, having come from 13 years of Catholic school, I raised my hand, even that in the State University in New York was kind of like, okay. And <laughs> I said, yeah. which one of these is right? <laughs> and, and he laughed and the entire class laughed at me because <laughs> I was looking for something that would be right. Well, the Revolt Against Maturity helped me look at psychology with a biblical theological perspective. But then it came time for, okay, you're going to run into people, people in your family, people in your church, people in your community, who by nature of their relationship with you are going to tell you about their problems or going to talk about things that are difficult. And so two books that had, I, three books, I said that before. Two, well, the first book is by Jay Adams called From Forgiven to Forgiving. Now, Jay Adams has written a lot of books on counseling. I know there are some people who don't like his orientation to counseling, but I read most of them and I found them useful. I didn't necessarily think that that was the only way to approach things, but I, it was like a body of knowledge that I felt through. I, I felt as though I had gone through serious coursework. But when I was given from forgiven to forgiving, it wasn't a book that I had in my library and it was given to me by a person who knew I was in the midst of a very difficult hurt between me and another person. And she said, I think you ought to read this book. Well, the book was life-changing because I realized that, yes, the Bible talks about restitution and things like that. There are some circumstances where the thing is not going to resolve this side of heaven. But the book gave me such a view on how to help other people and even myself when you're in the midst of a difficulty, when you're in the midst of a conflict with someone, have the orientation of having gone to the cross yourself and what you were forgiven and then view your conflict in that light. So that was extremely helpful. 
And it's a book that I actually recommend and give as wedding shower gifts (laughs) as something that, you know, what's, what's your advice to the newly married couple? Learn how to say, please forgive me. Yes. The other two books are from a man by the name of Ed Welsh, who I actually had the privilege of meeting back in 2004 when we were both at a memorial and funeral service from a mutual friend and family. And he is a counselor and he's a very gifted man in, I think, presenting biblical truth, but not with a sledgehammer, but with the understanding that the person he's talking to is more than likely hurting. And so the two books that I thought were very, when I looked at, because I have a lot of his books, but the two books, When People Are Big and God is Small, and then the other one is Addiction, Banquet in a Graveyard, which I think is a fantastic title. Um, (laughs) Yes. Because there's so many people that are hurting that fit into these categories. And maybe I'm just the kind of person that as I start talking to people, people will start sharing things with me. Well, I didn't want to be giving the gospel according to Andrea. I wanted to be able to really present an application of biblical law so that people understood that sin exists in all of us. So if you've been hurt by someone, sin is at the root of it. If you've hurt someone, sin is at the root of it. And rather than beat ourselves up because of that reality, learn to appreciate the wonderful gift that salvation really brings. And so those are two books that, you know, when I just look looking through my bookshelf and I see both of them, I smile because I remember those were so good for me. Those are excellent recommendations, uh, all of them. And I think it's interesting. There is a thread that runs through those, unless I'm greatly mistaken. Uh, Ed Welch was teaching at the Christian Counseling Center your Westminster Seminary when I was a student there. And I think he actually taught some courses at the seminary. So I met him several times. And of course, Jay Adams was the founder of the Christian Counseling and Education uh, Center. And both those men were writing from a presuppositional standpoint, as of course was Dr. Rush Dooney. Right. So I think that that is an interesting um, connection and, and very practical. That's the nice thing uh, that the, the thing that's most impactful, I think, in these various titles that you are mentioning is that they meet us where we are. You know, the Bible talks about real life problems. And uh, I think it was Gary North who used to properly uh, revile men who simply write theological articles to publish in seminary journals and are only talking to each other. And nobody ever reads those things. Most of us are dealing with problems like you just described of of forgiveness, of sorrow, of pain, of grief, joy, all, all these various things that intersect in our lives. And if we don't have any idea that the Bible speaks to all of this, then we're going to be looking to some other source. But by the writings of people like Jay Adams and Ed Welch, we can uh, find a, a biblical outlet. Okay. Now I'll hit the tennis ball back to you. Yeah, I've got actually uh, four more titles, but I want to mention two. Uh, let me just quick, very quickly say, without a lot of description, uh, an, another book I, I was very important to me was An Eschatology of Victory by J. Marcellus Kick. Uh, it helped me understand the postmillennial perspective of the book of Revelation and uh, a, the preteristic understanding of Matthew 24. But the nice thing about that book is the preface that was written by R.J. Rushdoony, from which the title of the book itself was taken. And I think he himself might have even said that it's, uh, it's the best title for a book he ever came up with us in life, An Eschatology of Victory. <laughs> and then his other book, which kind of is out there in the Chalcedon store. I don't know how many people avail themselves of it, but my word, I encourage everyone to get this book. It's uh, simply titled Sovereignty by R.J. Rastuni. And one reason I recommend it is that he spends a fair amount of time, not all of it, but one of the things he shows in that book is the harmful impact of pietistic Christianity on having a full-orbed understanding of a biblical worldview. But I want to move on to for my final two, if I may, a book that I read fairly recently that I saw reviewed somewhere. It's called From Shame to Sin, The Christian Transformation of Sexual Morality in Late Antiquity by Kyle Harper. Now, this man I don't think is a Christian. He teaches classics at the University of Oklahoma. But one of the things that he shows in this book, I think somewhat as a slightly objective observer, 
is the fact that the, the entire Roman world was completely changed by the missionary activity of Christianity, and specifically the place where it had the most profound impact was on this issue of sexual morality. And you can see in reading this how the pagan world really had no categories like what the biblical framework was, and that gives you a perspective on where we are today. Uh, Christianity is very, very quickly ceding all of this territory back to pagan non-biblical perspectives, and we see the resurgence of types of sexual morality and expression that probably haven't existed for six, 700 years or a thousand years in Western society. So that's uh, from shame to sin. And then the last book that I want to recommend is one that was actually given to me by my wife for Christmas. I don't know about you, Andrea, when, but when people give me books, or as you mentioned earlier, somebody suggested, if it's not already on my radar screen, I don't always read it. <laughs> somebody will give me a book. Yeah, okay, thank you. And I'll put it on my shelf. But I not only read this because my wife gave it to me for Christmas, but uh, the title is Live Not by Lies, A Manual for Christian Dissidents by Rod Dreher, who um, these days is an Eastern Orthodox convert. And the remarkable thing about this book is that he spent time interviewing Christians, both Protestant and Orthodox and Roman Catholic, who lived or were heavily exposed to life under communism behind the Iron Curtain. And it is absolutely riveting, not only the stories that they tell, but Dreer goes out of his way to show, or he really doesn't have to go out of his way, excuse me, to show how we're living in times that are very, very similar to what these people as Christians experienced in the former Soviet Union. And it is just a, a marvelous blessing to hear the, or to read the stories of these people and the courage and the faith that they exercised and the encouragement it should be and can be to us. And I want to stress again, these, on a certain level, you know, we are in a battle that crosses boundaries. You know, we can have these disputes and battles over various topics, you know, after we save our civilization. But for now, like these people found uh, in, the, in the Soviet Union, and Solzhenitsyn is another, he was incarcerated with Jews, Baptists, other Orthodox, who all were fighting for the same struggle. And I can't recommend this book highly enough, Live Not by Lies, A Manual for Christian Dissidents by Rod Dreher. I hear you saying, and I, I agree, that when you don't know history, it's very easy to place um, your current circumstances as the worst ever. And when you talk about, I'll go back to your book on your recommendation, um, Eschatology of Victory, it's that if you think that 2021 is the worst that anything has ever been, and you don't understand that the church through most of its history believed in the victory of Christ Jesus, both in time and eternity, and that they weren't so concerned with their immediate circumstances because they had a kingdom view. And so the second book that you talked about, which I hadn't heard of, and now it's another book I get to buy, is understanding that this is something that is not new, there's nothing new under the sun, but being encouraged by people who in the face of what would be called hardship, tribulation, persecution, that the goal, the gold of their faith emerged. And I think that's something that American Christians, you know, we've had it pretty easy for a long time. And as soon as the, you know, the water gets a little warm, it's like, oh my goodness, we have to be raptured out of here, as opposed to God uses these circumstances to refine us and make us fit for heaven. One of the great um, speeches ever given in the 20th century was given by Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the receiving of the Templeton Prize for Religion. And at the time, I believe he had already been exiled from his home, his mother country of Russia. And the man had experienced some of the most horrific trials and tribulations any person, Christian or otherwise, could go through in Stalin's concentration camps, and then, then being forcibly kicked out of the country and his motherland. And at the time, the Soviet Union was still a, an absolute power on the face of the earth, and a, a, a title under which, from which most, most people cringed. But that man stood before this international forum, and he declared no matter how communism bristles with its tanks and rockets, it is doomed never 
to defeat Christianity. He understood something about this. Uh, he, he didn't cower. He kept right on with his writings, and he was not writing from what we consider a reform standpoint, but he was writing from a Christian biblical standpoint that recognized that the, the kingdoms of men are, are doomed in that sense, and the future is as bright as the promises of God. All right, so I'm going to pivot a little bit and talk about some books that maybe people would think, really, these are among your favorite. But let me preface it by saying when we were converted— people had said, oh, you need to read C.S. Lewis. And have you read the Narnia series? And it's like Narnia, I hadn't heard of Narnia. Those weren't circles I traveled in. And so my husband and I read Mere Christianity. Mere Christianity had a tremendous impact on him. I liked it, but it didn't have the same impact. And I read aloud the seven volume Narnia series to my son. And I liked it, right? I, I thought it was good, but it wasn't earth changing. Somewhere along the line, I encountered a series of books called Tales of the Kingdom Trilogy by Karen and David Maines. And mm. the first book was called Tales of the Kingdom. And then subsequently, they came out with Tales of the Resistance and Tales of the Restoration. Well, as I always did when I got a book, I would read it first <laughs> before I would read it aloud to the kids. But I was so taken by this book that I read it. Then I read it to my children. And then when my husband came home from work, I said, you have to hear this because I knew he wouldn't sit down and read it. So it became a book that has given me analogous situations since the late 80s when I, when I read it. Hmm. And the significance of it is the kingdom, the fact that the kingdom faces resistance and the fact that it is restored. And I, it's, it's very different than the Narnia series because I think the connections are much stronger than maybe C.S. Lewis's Who the Lion Stood For. And it's just a delightful series of books. And in the original format, the illustrations were delightful. And it's the sort of thing, as I said, I'll give you an example. There's one aspect of the book that talks about when people had sightings and what a sighting was is when you had seen the king hmm. but sometimes the sighting the king might have been camouflaged as a woodcutter or the king might have been camouflaged as a beggar and if you go back to whatever you do to the least of my brethren you do unto me but people in the story didn't always recognize that they had seen the king until afterwards. And so there was this whole part where people would talk about sightings. Have you had a sighting of the king? And they would share it. Well, back when we had a house church meeting in our home, we would have a regular time where people would talk about their sightings. And it was just marvelous because it was encouraging, whether it was somebody saying, well, I was in the midst of waiting for a medical procedure and I had this encounter with somebody and I was able to share with them. And it was identified as a sighting of the king. And it's been the sort of thing that still remains with us when we would talk about, and I won't go through everything, but like, yes, that's like Amanda's dragon, or that's a sighting, or that happened in terms of a naysayer. So it gave us a whole context on which to enjoy our life, what was going on within the framework of this really fun and I think theologically deep book or series of books. So what would you say would be an option for any of our listeners who are interested for a source or outlet to find recommendations other than say, listening to this podcast for books that they might consider reading nowadays, either older books or books that are currently being published. Well, I think it boils down to asking people what books had impact in your life. Now, of course, if you don't respect the person who gives you the answer, then you're probably not going to do it. <laughs> but um, I was just sharing, like there's two other books that, I could put into the category of where I was at. One was called Song of Survival, and the author was Helen Kalane. Well, how did I come across this book? Well, there was a movie that had come out, I'm thinking it's in the 90s somewhere, called Paradise Road. And it was the story or the dramatized version of a story of a number of women who were being evacuated 
during the war and their ship was shot at. And so they became prisoners of the Japanese. And these were Australian women, English women, Dutch women. And so here they all were on this island. And two of the women who stood out on it, one was an accomplished British violinist. And the other one was a Presbyterian missionary, a woman who had been very active in her church. And so they perceived that what was needed to bring these women together that didn't all speak the same language was music. Hmm. And so they actually started what was called a vocal orchestra that instead of singing words, they sang notes. And so between the English woman and the, the Presbyterian woman, I think she was also British, what they did was they created a situation where the women started a choir. And that intrigued me. So I immediately went and saw what was this based on? Because I don't always trust Hollywood movies. And not only did I find out there was a book that the movie was based on, I found out that the woman lived close to me. So I ended up meeting the author, which is kind of how we got to meet Dr. Rush Dooney. I was like, oh, wow, he's alive and he lives close <laughs> to us. So anyway, so I met her and we became friends. And mm. when I was participating with the homeschool choir in our area, we actually put on a concert of this music that they had done in the prisoner of war camp. And she came and she was there as our special guest. So it's the kind of thing that when you see something that speaks to you and what spoke to me in this whole story was hope in the midst of things that seemed desperate and there was no hope. Well, talk about, talk about Providence. There it is. There is a funny story with regards to this story. So Helen ended up writing the book, but she said that, you know, you have a bad singing voice when you're in a prisoner of war camp and they won't let you in the choir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so she became the chronicler of events, but she, she still laughed at the fact that even there they said you can't be in the choir. <laughs> that would be a pretty good indication, I think. <laughs> And then the other book, let me just say, was yep. Stepping Heavenward by Elizabeth Prentice. I'm not sure it's a man's book, but it's a book that I know has encouraged many women. I shared it with my own daughters, and when they read it, it was an encouragement to them. It's just that it was, it's written from the point of view of the life of a wife and mother isn't always easy, but with Christ being the focal point of your life, you can be enriched even in happy times, difficult times, regular times, irregular times. And so that was a book that I very highly recommend to women and their daughters. I would like to suggest to our listeners that if they uh, want to find other resources for books they may have never heard of that would be uh, either reviewed or recommended, that they um, take note of what you wrote in the latest issue of uh, the Chalcedon newsletter about this podcast in which we sort of with all humility, see ourselves building on the, uh, the old from the easy chair tapes uh, that the Calcedon Foundation used to publish by cassette tape with Dr. Rush Dooney and Mark and Otto Scott and a host of other people. Because in those uh, from the easy chair discussions, a lot of books were talked about and reviewed uh, with uh, amazing perspectives. Take people you respect Take people who you think are worthy of emulating how they approach their kingdom service and then ask them the things that mean something to them because that's how you will expand your view. Now, talking about things that impact you at a particular time, when I first was converted, the first Bible that I was using was the American Standard Bible. Oh, wow. And, yeah. and so I, that's the first one somebody recommended. Anyway, it's on my shelf. I still have it. And I look at the marks I made in that Bible, underline, exclamation point, you know, <laughs> highlight it. Yes. And for the life of me, Charles, I'm like, why did that mean so much to me then? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, really? What, what was that about? And I think it's possible to forget where we were and how we thought when we were first converted. But I think it's important to go back and remember those things 
because it'll help us be much more patient with the people who we encounter who are maybe new to the faith. And we're like, how come this concept is so hard for you? I look back and I said, obviously, these were new revelations to me, but to me, they seem not trite because I wouldn't say anything in the Bible is trite, but they seem so obvious. Yes. So any well, other books? I, I still have a couple more on my list that I was going to share, but uh, I don't want to – it sounded like you exhausted yours. Well, I mean, I, I could go on for another three hours, but the, the, I just pared it down to those in particular for the sake of our discussion. So please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So there's two, I will call them fiction books, but if you read them and then you can get a hold of them, you'll see that they may have been prophetic books. One was called Weeping at Rama, hmm. written by a J.R. Lucas. It was something that was given to me in the late 80s. And it was specifically talking about abortion, but then the use of harvesting organs for the elite and keeping people alive so that they could have their body parts used. And I know we had a, a podcast recently on organ transplantation and the ethics and morality of it, but I think that's where I started to have this sense of how ugly and perverse man can be without God. And so I, I think it's still available. I mean, if you go to Amazon, you, you might be able to find it. Anyway, it's called Weeping at Rama. The other one is a book called Highland by Franklin Sanders. Now, how we found out about Highland, we were up visiting Dr. Rush Dooney and we were getting in the car, we were about to leave. And my husband asked the question, so like, what do you think is gonna happen in the future? you know, things like that. Again, this was in the 80s. A lot of these things happened to us in the 80s. And Dr. Rush Jenny said, well, I can't say for sure, but this, there's, there's this man, Franklin Sanders, who's written a book called Highland. And he thinks that this is maybe where we're headed. So of course, we went ahead and got Highland and fascinated by it. And in it, there were a lot of previews of for example, the split in our country. We would call it red state, blue state, conservative, liberal, elites, deplorables, however it's categorized now, but it was described in this book. Also, it was the idea of abortion and euthanasia factories. So what would happen is people would go and they would sign up their elderly parents to this resort and this resort would be an opportunity for them to eat well, do well, and then they would be given something and they would just go to sleep. <laughs> and so this was a way in which families could deal with their elderly. Oh, so yes. We don't exactly have that now, but you think about what happened with elderly people in nursing homes and COVID and things like that, you realize we're not that far off. So I have recommended it to people and they've gotten it and they're like, wow. Franklin Sanders had a prophetic view of where life could go in the United States. And Dr. Rush Jr. didn't think he was that far off. It doesn't sound like he was at all. And then the last three I would mention are recent books that I've read. Two of them were written by people who I had recently interviewed for this podcast. Jerry Boyer's book, Maker Versus Takers. And Vishal Mangawadi's book, The Book That Made Your World, How the Bible Created the Soul of Western Civilization. These are books that I happen to originally listen to. So it was like that if you're in the car or you're exercising or whatever it is, the audible option is a good one. But the one talks in terms of how relevant the circumstances, the context, the places are in the account of the Gospels that will give greater understanding. And of course, Vishal's book is a good refutation of the Bible is unnecessary. Western civilization has been one of oppression. He goes into detail that it's not the case at all. Without the Bible, we would not have the good things in modern society. Yeah, that's the advantage of uh, many books like that. And now you've just recommended two that I have to add to my library, uh, gladly so. But when we read books, especially that bring us an analysis of previous centuries or millennia, the shame of sin, uh, 
Uh, it was another book I could have recommended about homosexuality and bisexuality in the ancient world. It, it gives us a perspective about how things were in, uh, in the earliest Christian centuries and the absolute monolithic structure of evil paganism that our forebears faced, and yet it, they faced it with hope and anticipation, as you said, of the advancement of, of Christ's kingdom. I think too often we think that we live in an absolutely unique age and with all the technology and all the rest of it, but uh, at the bottom, the technology is being driven by very fallible men. And so to that extent, uh, these sort of things repeat themselves as those given over to a non-biblical perspective repeat the same errors that were repeated going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Right. And these last two books that I've mentioned were recommendations from people I value their opinion. And the last one I'll mention, and I'm really hoping to get an interview with this man. I've requested it a number of times, and I'm still hoping he says yes. The author is Joshua Mitchell, and he's written a book called American Awakening, Identity Politics, and Other Afflictions of Our Time. Mm, yeah. And the book was recommended by my children. You know, so it goes to show that when your children grow up and you've educated them and they've pursued trying to understand the world around them, sometimes <laughs> you can learn a lot. But the underlying theme of this book that I just referenced is man will always look for atonement. Mm. And the man is coming from a Christian perspective is that if it's not going to be Jesus Christ, and man is not going to accept the idea of forgiveness and mercy, which, of course, the modern description of identity politics is you're guilty and you will always be guilty. And there's nothing you can do to not be guilty, that the message of Scripture has been rejected. And I find it very, very interesting. And I found it to be something that gave me an appreciation for how to approach people in terms of accusations. Well, you wouldn't understand because you were not this, or you have this advantage, you know, you have this privilege. And he undercuts all of it. Would it convince the people who are espousing those ideas? Maybe not, but it certainly would bolster people who know that I shouldn't be guilty because God gave me a skin color. I should not feel guilty because God placed me in a particular family. So he points out that we take things that we should be thankful for because God is sovereign. Let's go back to that idea and then say, I don't apologize for those things. I don't say I, I'm wrong because I'm white. I say, if my offense to you in this area was sin, I ask your forgiveness that we take responsibility for that which we can be responsible. Well, that sounds especially like a very timely book. And I think that that and... I think most all of the ones that you and I both have recommended or mentioned are fairly easily uh, available from wherever you typically, wherever our listeners typically buy their books. Well, thanks, Charles. I'm grateful that uh, you took the time to go through your, I don't even want to call them your top 100. We didn't go over 100. If other people who are listening have suggestions as to books that we should have mentioned and didn't, Feel free to contact us at out of the question podcast at gmail.com. And we look forward to joining you again in the future. Thanks for listening to Out of the Question. For more information on this and other topics, please visit calcedon.edu.